Journey is a Unity 101-led project, supported by the National Heritage Lottery here in the UK. It is about the experience, the journey, of people from all over the world who come to settle in this city. You'll be hearing stories, information and conversations from and about those people. They change the DNA of this place in a good way. That fusion is the new Southampton. Okay, so today is the 21st of March. My name is Natalie Barris. Yes, Natalie. Uh, I am here in Southampton. We are doing an interview with, please introduce yourself. Oh, hang on, let me get this microphone in the right position. There we go, like that. Introduce yourself to me. Well, I'm Kavita Kapoor. I have lived in Southampton since 1971. Came here with my parents. Had no option but had to come. And, uh, you know, have been educated in this country. Have worked for the University of Solent for 20 years. Started as a small project accountant and they never let go of me which was nice and uh, then got married and moved into this house and here we are <laughs> still here I'm just gonna move this sorry this is my fault these microphones are a bit annoying right so what I want to know is how old <coughs> well no let's start right at the beginning so you were born where where Nairobi, were... Kenya what year I was born in 1954 and what is your first memory growing up? In Kenya, a lovely, happy home, lots of fun, lots of joy, lots of telling off by our father when we do lots of wrong things, playing in the street with the boys, because I came after my brothers. So what happened is, I used to never play girly things. I have never had a girly toy. I only had Gully Danda, which is a typical Indian, you know, game. And then, you know, that, you know, cycle wheel, the big cycle wheel, all the boys used to do racing. So I used to do racing with them, with that cycle wheel. So I have grown up as a tomboyish, you can say. <laughs> so describe <coughs> what, so hang on, so you were born in Nairobi. Did you always live in the same house? Yes, yes. Describe that. Our house, uh, my, you know, when I grew up, I remember myself in that house. It was how many bedrooms? One, two, three, four, five bedrooms. Kitchen, dining room, no dining, dining and lounge together, and bathroom, and little veranda and a garden in the front and a god, small garden in the back and our dog with a dog house in the back of the garden. And where was it in Nairobi? <coughs> Nairobi South B, Zanzibar Road. Wow. And what did your parents do? What were their jobs? My father was uh, the head of uh, finance in, uh, the in the British government before in the treasury. And when Kenya got independence in 1967, he was then taken up to the Harambe House, which was the main government offices, and made head of the, uh, what would I would call, call it, uh, judicial department, to analyze and analyze the, fig, the paperwork and everything, and read about them and everything, and the commitments which were there for the government and what had been committed, how many years, and things like that. So in, he analyzed that. So he was moved from the treasury, where he used to work, into the Harambe house. Wow. And your mum? My mum was a lovely housewife, happy housewife. Mm -hmm. She looked after us. She was very fond of music. She was very fond of uh, religion. My father was very religious. He was the head of the Sanatan Dharma school and the society in Kenya. 
He was the president of that. What is that? <coughs> that is the, you know, like the Hindu Vedic society. Mm -hmm. Exactly like that. You know, they came and built this Hindu Vedic society when they came here in 71. Our pa parents were the founder members of, the, have actually built that temple. And similarly in Kenya, in Nairobi, Shri Sanatan Dharam was the um, society which was for all the Asians. People came, all the Asians, and next to that was the Shiv Mandir, which was mostly Gujarati, but the community interchanged from one to the other. And he was the president of that society, Hindu Vedic, Hindu Shri Sanatan Dharam in Nairobi. Hmm. Why were your mum and dad in Kenya? Why was my mum and dad in Kenya? Because my grandfather came from India and they were actually living in 1937-42 in the Pakistan side of, the, uh, of Punjab where, you know, where uh, Bin Laden was killed, Aptabad. Aptabad is the city where Bin Laden was stationed and he was killed by the Americans at Aptabad. We actually come from Aptabad, which is the town Punjab of, uh, you know, which was the old Punjab of India before the partition. So we came from there, but because there was so much, you know, sort of people were aware that things were going to go wrong you know, when India got independence. So my father decided to move the whole family from Aptabad because my, my maternal grandfather was the postmaster general of Aptabad post office in Aptabad. My maternal, my mom's dad, he was the postmaster of, and he knew that the things were going wrong. So he stayed back but he moved the whole family because at that, on, during those times in 42, you know, they did not want unmarried girls to move from one place to the other because if they were caught, they would be raped. By who? By Muslims or by vice versa, you know, killed by the Hindus if they were Muslims because of this conflict that was going, in, in, going on in India between Hindus and Muslims because Jinnah wanted his own Pakistan and Gandhi did not want to split the country. So there was conflict of interests between the two communities. <coughs> and what happened is, so they married my father and my mother got married and they were moved from Aptabad to India, to Delhi in India. And my father decided that this finding a job at that time in India was next to impossible. So to have to look after the parents and then having got a wife to get, you know, she got, and then he had one brother and he was married as well. So, you know, like to look after the, fr and one sister. So it was a large family to be have to look after. So he decided to come to Kenya. And he was not a qualified accountant at that time, but he came to Kenya and he started living in Nairobi in one bathroom because he did not have the money to rent a, ho uh, rent a room. So what he decided, he said, I will sleep in the bathroom at night. In the morning, I will wrap up everything and I will put it one of the, in one of the neighbors, one of the people who lived there put my night clothes and everything and everything in bags and there. <coughs> and he lived there for six months and he worked and he collected every single penny that he earned. So he was living in a shared house, but he didn't have a room. He lived in the bathroom of a house. Yes, because nobody used the bathroom at night. And he would come out in the morning and go to work and he would come back at night. What work was he doing? Do you know? Well, at that time he was doing a sort of like an ordinary clerical job and he started studying. He wanted to qualify as, as an accountant so that he could get a professional job. 
and then within six years he passed all the exams accountancy exams <clears throat> and he came to Kenya in 1938 and within five years by you know 38 39 40 40 43 43 he got my mother and my grandparents to come to Kenya so he got the, uh, two rooms for them and a place where they could live comfortably mm -hmm. and that's how he started his life that was your father that's my dad and so talk me through <coughs> in your family brothers and sisters who was born when and where well my eldest I had two elder sisters they were all we are all born in Nairobi Kenya all of us are born in Kenya I think it's amazing what your dad did. That's phenomenal. Um, oh, yes. My dad was a phenomenal character. I'm telling you, we absolutely hats off to him that he was our father. Thank you, God, for making him our father. And thank you, God, for making my mother our mother. They were one of the most lovable, happy family couple. They gave us a very happy life. Mm. We have no words to thank them. In this whole world, you know, many times we say thank you to them. It is, they are not enough. Mm. <coughs> so you remember growing up, you remember, what was school like? In Nairobi? Mm. Well, school was just, it was a school with, it was a very conservative school. So we had a white shirt and a blue t blue skirt and a tie to wear, which we used to always say, why do we have to wear this tie? But we were to wear that black shoes and white socks. That was our primary, secondary school, you know. Mm -hmm. But it was fun in the sense that it was a co-ed school. It was not a, it was co-ed, so it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And we used to fight with each other and we used to come home with our ties taken off. Our <laughs> shirts out of our skirts and everything. <coughs> like any children, like any children. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to reposition your mic. Is everything sounding okay? Yeah. yeah, no no issues, no rubbing on the clothes or anything? No, at the moment it's fine. TK, if there is yeah. any issue, just let me yeah. let me know. Only one thing. Mine? You, you, you can hear mine? Yeah. All right, that we can just delete. That's no problem. So that's how, you know, life in Kenya was lovely. How old were you when you left then? 16, 17, yeah, 16. Why did your parents <coughs> decide that you were leaving? My brothers, my elder brother, Harish, who was studying in Liverpool, and my other brother, Yash, was studying in uh, Liverpool as well. He was doing medicine and my brother was doing, no, he had finished his, no, no, he had finished his university. Yash was still in Liverpool. And uh, my brother, eldest brother was, Head hunted by Dr. Gambling in Southampton because he actually topped the university in Liverpool. My elder brother, my eldest brother, you know, he was a very, very clever guy. So, you know, he was head hunted by Professor Gambling to come and do a PhD in laser optics. So, he gave him a full scholarship and got him from Liverpool to Southampton. And he was doing a PhD in, South, in Southampton under Professor Gambling. And then <coughs> my father retired from the government service in 1970, you know, after Kenya got independence and, you know, things were stabilized and everything. And he retired and my, fa my, my father asked my mom, you know, the government will keep me for another 50 years. What do you want to do? She said, I miss my sons. I want to go where my sons are. My dad explained him her so much, whatever you do, you know, your sons are not going to come every day at home. Like you are thinking here, they come home and you make food and you see, we all sit down around the table and have a giggle and a laugh and have food together. You're not going to have the same life in England. But she was so adamant and said, no, I want to go where I want to go. So you don't want to take me, it's your wish, 
my father said, I would have I ever done that <coughs> to make you unhappy about something. If you say this is what you do, I will, I will take you there. So he decided. He decided to leave Kenya and we came to Southampton in 1971. He came in 70. So he came in February and we came in 1971 on July the 3rd. And the thing was like, you know, he bought the house in Southampton. He came to Southampton and he and my brother bought the house 88 Tennyson Road. And they redecorated the whole house, made it modern, made things which are required in a house, you know, for you to live, obviously. And then we came. So for us, for my mom and me, the transition was from one house to another. My father and my brother were at the airport to pick us up. My brother had made sandwiches and everything and made tea. And we stopped on the way. And we all sat down and had, had our sandwiches and tea and everything and came home. And then it was from one home to another. And I just came. He was obviously going to the university. I came and went to do my A-levels. So how old were you when you flew her? 17. 54. And? 74, uh, 71. 54, 64, 70, 60. Uh, I would be, you know, 20, uh, you know. 54, 64, 70, 6 more. 17? Yeah. And how did you feel about your mum deciding that she wanted to go to England? It was nothing to do with me. I had no say in it. I would follow my parents wherever they went. You didn't feel that you would miss... Kenya or your friends? I think, you know, this concept of missing friends and is not there. You know, when your parents love you, care for you and everything, you just don't think. You just, you know, take it for granted that whatever your parents are going to do is going to be the best. Although when I came here and I told my mom, why did you have to come here? You know, it's so cold, mom. And I used to, you know, I lose, lost eight overcoats. Eight overcoats from August, September, when it started getting windy and cold, to the March. Everywhere I went, I left my overcoat there. If I went in a bus, I left my overcoat there. If I went to school, I went left my overcoat there. I used to forget picking up that overcoat because I did not know. And my father used to go to the... <coughs> bus station and go to the lost properties and go and collect my overcoats. Um, how long had you not seen your brother for? So he, they, or both your brothers had left Kenya to yeah, go they were, to England. They were studying here, you know, like, and my brother was actually, the eldest brother was in Southampton, so we came here. So he saw my elder brother, hmm. but the younger brother was in, in uh, Liverpool. But when had they left Africa? They had left Africa six, six, seven years before, eight years. No, no, in fact, Yash came, Yash did his A-level, so for six, seven, eight years, eight years. So 61 uh, would be 10 years, so 62, 63. So when you were a little girl? You... Yeah, yeah. Was it weird seeing them in... Because there's not like video calls like there is nowadays or... No, no, no. It's not, you know what, you, when you're children, you know, and anybody asks you, where is your brother? My brother is in England. He's studying, you know. It was very big thing. My brother is in England studying. That was enough. You know, and you knew your brother, you know, like I used to, we used to also say, we don't know. You know, I used to never go with my elder brother. And so I don't want to go with him. Mm -hmm. He's so clever. And the teacher says, if he's so clever, why aren't you clever? <laughs> so I didn't get all the brain that he's got. <laughs> <coughs> it was so funny. It used to be so funny. I'm sort of, you know, I remember, you know, when, uh, you know, he, he got, you know, in his A-levels, you know, when he did his A-levels, before he came to do the electronics here in South, in England, <coughs> and he was given an offer uh, for do to do electronics 
with two bees and a C. And this brother of mine had eight A's across the board and A pluses. Clever. Clever clogs he is. Even now he's, you know, he runs his own chair in, in America at the Wakeful University. He runs the Chosunak chair. And people come and do PhDs under him. Wow. Yeah. <coughs> he's always been very clever. He's always been very bright. And even when he topped the university in Liverpool, it was nothing surprising. For us, it was not surprising. Because we are so used to him, you know, topping up the school, topping up the class, topping up the university, topping up everything. You know, we were so used to that topping up. Even when he came here and topped up the university, it was nothing a big thing. Wow. It was quite a normal thing, normal. You know, we never made a big thing out, and neither did my father make a big thing out of it. And when he said to my father that he's got full scholarship to do PhD, shall I go ahead and do it? My father said, yes, of course. How can you refuse a thing like that? So I want to talk about you. <coughs> when you came here, when you were 17, how did you make the journey? You flew? Yeah, we flew. Yeah, we flew. Was that your first time on a plane? Yep. Talk me through that, what your memories are <coughs> of the actual journey. I'm telling you, it was so funny. I get, got dressed up. My mom said, Tonight we are flying, so I got really dressed up with a nice long frock and everything and everything. And during those times, you know, they used to wear those big clogs, clog heels. Oh, like 70s, flat, flat, yeah? Yeah, platform, platform heels. I had never worn a platform heel. So I told my mom, I'm going to the shops to buy a platform heel. In England, everybody will be wearing platform heels. So how can I not wear platform heels? So I bought this platform heel. So I wore it and throw my fell down on the pavement. <laughs> <coughs> I didn't know how to walk in them. I had never walked in plan. And all my knees were grazed and everything. I took the platform shoes off and held them in my hand. <laughs> when I was going on the air, in an aircraft, put my old shoes on, <laughs> walked up to the aircraft, all through the airport. I said, Mom, my legs are hurting. Oh, my mom, my That's all I remember of that flight. <laughs> to me, going into the plane and going and sit, yeah, climbing the steps was so difficult. <laughs> you know, holding the bar and climbing the steps. Because the knees were all grazed. That had fallen. And even my arms were grazed because I fell like that, you know, forward. How did you know platform heels were the thing to be wearing in England? <coughs> because it used to be there, every, you know, like, we never wore them because we were still at school and things like that. But they were talked about, you know, like in your group, your friends. Talked about, you're going to England, you must take platform heels. Everybody wears platform heels. You know, you, whatever girls say to each other. You know, girly talks. Mm -hmm. So decided to go and buy flat platform meals. I love it that that was your memory of going to England. What were you, when you arrived in England, what was your first impression? Believe it, I had no impression. I was just happy to see my father and my brother. That was all that was, you know, all that I saw in the whole crowd was just two people. And, you know, my father hugging us and my brother hugging and then saying, come on, let's go, let's go and sat in the house in the car and everything. And then my mom told them, you know, <coughs> and he said, why are you walking like that, you know? What's wrong with you? So I didn't say anything. So he'll tell me off. My dad will tell me off. So I, you know, so I came and sat in the car very quietly and I said, and mom's told them what, I should, what she has done. And she has got all her legs and arms grazed and she's suffering and then my brother got some paracetamol I think he must have <coughs> gave me those tablets to eat and then he said I'll go home and when we get home I will put then he put some medicine and everything and everything and he said what were you doing and mom said you see the shoes that she's bought look at the shoes that she's got there my brother said, I'm going to throw that in the middle of bin. <laughs> you know, that, that's all my first impressions of getting to England. <laughs> and what about your first impression 
of Southampton. Do you remember what you first thought when you saw the city? Well, went to school. I, you know, I used to love Southampton because it looked like Nairobi with greenery and everything like that. So I loved, you know, going to the common and things like that. <clears throat> it was like a very happy place. Mm -hmm. Lots of greenery, you know, and we used to walk everywhere. We used to walk to the university, walk to the school and come uh, to the, you know, uh, to, when I was doing my A-levels. And, uh, you know, uh, to this uh, in uh, athlete school, mm -hmm. you know, next to athlete school, you know, Taunton College, did my A-levels. So just walk there and come back and see this greenery and everything. The winters were very difficult, as I told you. July, August were okay. Because we came on, in July, the weather was fine. August was fine. You know, it was still warmer. But as soon as October ended, uh, August ended, and the winds and all those things started, that was the end of me. I hated you. I used to tell my mom. Why did you have to come? And then I was to say to my dad, why didn't you bring Mangi with you? What's that? Our servant, you know, our servant who did all the housework, not the gardener, the inside. So why didn't you bring Mangi with you? We have to do everything. And I did not know how to wash dishes. I did not know how to cook mm. <coughs> or clean or anything. Because never done it. And my brother... When we ate dinner, after we had finished eating dinner, my I would sit, I would get up from there, go and watch the television. And my mother would see my brother, elder brother, pick up all the plates from the dining table, take them into the sink and start washing them. My father would take all the dirty clothes to the laundrette and wash them, get them dried and everything, fold them up and everything, bring them and give us our points. Here I did not do anything. And my mother used to come in the lounge and say, haven't you got any shame? You know, get up from this TV and go and help your brother. He's washing all the dishes. And I used to then start crying. So I'm being told off every day. I used to tell him, you know, why didn't you not bring Mangi then? You should have brought Mangi with us. You know, every day you are telling me off. <laughs> so, then my brother taught me how to, he said, you take this tea cloth, when I wash, then you take the, then you dry them like this and put them there. So he taught me how to wash the dishes, how to dry them, put them away. I'm telling you, it was hard work. <laughs> <coughs> so what did you do after, well, let me just check, how many minutes have we recorded? Uh, okay, fine. What were you studying at Taunton's? I did my A-levels uh, there with the, in mathematics, uh, statistics and English. Also a clever clocks. Not really, not really. What did you, did you want to work? Yes, yes, I wanted, I qualified as an accountant. Mm. I did a SEMA, then I did a chartered accountancy qualification and worked for the university as a accountant. First of all, I worked there as a project accountant and they wanted to look for a project accountant because they wanted to buy a simulator and the university was not ready to spend money to buy a new simulator. If they hadn't bought a new simulator for Wozash, then 60 odd people would have been made redundant. What do you mean a simulator? Simulator, simulator is, you know, like a ship bridge. You know, when the ships go on in sea, the, uh, you know, the bridge where they do all the manipulations and everything. The same thing is replicated in a simulator, which is called a ship bridge simulator. And people are trained, pilots are trained how to maneuver the ships to avoid like what happened to the Titanic. That was a mistake of the, you know, not turning the ship enough early time to, in order to avoid the iceberg. So you get, need to know at what distance the ship has to come how it has to turn, at what level it has to turn, what angle it has to turn, because it's a huge, big thing to turn, which is the mistake that he did in Titanic, mm. miscalculating that distance of... So we trained them using that bridge strip. The simulator we had in Bozash was an old one. It needed to be replaced. 
Now, I did a project, I did the costing for that project. And we had to buy three million pounds to get a new simulator. Now, I did that project and everything, and we, submit, we went and put the presentation to the board in, at the Solent University, at the, you know, in New Road, and they accepted the project. And they, they said, they, you know, but she, and they said she's the temporary accountant, only project accountant recorded for two years. They said we'll give her a permanent job, and we want her to, because she has done the costing, we want her to build the whole simulator to the end, <coughs> and then do run courses, and so she will be the accountant. She was, and then they recruited me as an accountant. And I worked there for 10 years. And my projection was that uh, the simulator would start breaking even after 10 years. After eight years, it broke even. And then after that, there was no coming back. And you, you know, the, these Wozash College was survived. You know, 70 or people, their jobs were, were safe. It, that was the biggest achievement, I think to have those people mm -hmm. not lose their jobs. So this was your first job after... <coughs> so after did you go to university? Yeah, yeah. I Where did you go to university? Here in Southampton. And what did you study at university? Economics and uh, then chartered accountancy. This was University of Southampton you went to? This one. The Burgess you... Road. Okay. Hmm. And what was university like? Fun. My brother was there. And my father was working in the university. They had, you know, when he came from Nairobi, so he wanted to work and he was, he, they gave him a job. So he was in the finance department at the university and my brother was in the lab, in the Professor Gambling's lab down in the electronics. I could not do anything. I used to just have fun. I used to, you know, I'm, the funniest part was, <coughs> we used to have so much fun. We had so many multi, cultural friends. It was not that we, you know, I had, we had, I, we had so many friends. And some were Indian, some were not Indian. You know, we were, and he, Ryan, one of my best friends, Ryan, we used to study together and everything. We had this, you know, when we qualified and everything, and we had this bowl at the university. And everybody goes to the ball, university ball. That is the biggest thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. At the end of the year, after qualification, to go to the ball. And Ryan said, what are you going to do? How are you going to go, come to the ball? Your father is my mother is never going to allow you come. I said, Ryan, you better come home <coughs> and get to know my parents. And get to know my parents, my mother more than my father. And, but then he knew Ryan. My brother knew Ryan. Because, you know, he used to meet him when we used to sort of walk together, come home in the evening together. Because we lived at 88 Tennyson Road and he, they lived further down Tennyson Road. So we used to walk together. Ryan was your friend or your boyfriend? My friend. Okay. We didn't know what his boyfriends. For us, boyfriends was not the, uh, not never, not a concept that crossed our head. He used to come <coughs> and shout, Kavita, are you ready? Yes, I am to go and walk together. Have a laugh, have a giggle, giggle, study and everything, come back. And my father, so then Ryan came to us and I asked my father, I said, this is a big ball. And my brother, Harish said, yes, dad, it's a very big thing and everybody goes to the ball, you know, and everything. So would you allow her? But he, he says, yes, who are you going to? I said, dad, I only know Ryan as a, I, who, who, with whom I go and come. The rest of them are all colleagues in the class, but he lives near our house. So my father agreed. And my mother agreed with him. That was the blessing in <laughs> from the Almighty God. So I bought a lovely long blue dress with a black belt. You know, really, really very smart looking, you know. And so my father said, but you have to be home by midnight. You cannot go beyond midnight, okay? He told Ryan that as well, and he told me that. Well, this is the only reason I'm going to send my daughter with you. 
We never drank. We, we never we used to never drink. We have never drunk any spirit, wine, nothing. Never crossed our mind because it was not needed. There was enough love in the family and enough care, devotion in the family that you never thought of drinks. So all you drank was orange and coke. Not even orange coke, I think, mostly. We were busy dancing and having fun and everything. Didn't realize it was already 12 o'clock. And Ryan saw and said, Kavito, it's 12 o'clock. It's gone 12 o'clock. We are both going to be dead by the time we get to your house. <laughs> and then, funny enough, we had got the cab. So the cab was standing outside. The dad had booked the cab for us to come back at night. So we got into the cab and came home. And here, my father and mother, all lights flashing. My father in the lounge, my mother in, in, in the lounge, walking up and down, up and down. Where is she? <coughs> got home at, it was half past twelve, gone half past twelve. We came home and my father looked at me as if he was going to strangle me. I said, hey, they made this earth open and I go down in it and it gets close. <laughs> Can't face my father. And then he said, Ryan, thank you very much. He said, and Ryan apologized. He said, Mr. Sunak, I'm very sorry. You know, we did not keep track of the time. We did not, you know, I'm really sorry. I sincerely apologize. My father said, that's all right happen and my father did not say anything to me he said go change and go to sleep and I went and slept next morning the bala king I got <laughs> was unbelievable <laughs> that's that was what university was like fun <laughs> funny things that we did <laughs> Um, <laughs> when, did you ever have any, like, issues, any negative, um, kind of issues with people in Southampton because of being a different ethnicity from other people, or did you ever face any kind of racism or anything? I would say I did not face anything like that while I was at university. Hmm. I had friends and we were treated like friends. But when I came to, in, in the professional world, working as an accountant and working as, first of all, the problem was I was a female. First, then I'm Asian, right? And then I'm working in a man's world. So, many a times, they would not recognize my ability and my qualifications to the extent that they could. And I would come across glass, uh, glass ceilings at various <coughs> points. And for example, I, they said to me, would you like to do an MBA? We'll give you a day release, will you do an MBA? Yeah, I said, I will. I remember I did an MBA. Karan was doing, my son Karan was doing his A-levels and I was doing my MBA finals. Both of us used to sit on the dining table and my husband Krishan used to make food for us, make tea for us and everything and say, we got to, I've got two children in school studying. And I did an MBA and I passed my MBA in flying colors. I'm sort of, I could have, had there not been glass ceilings, I could have been the director of uh, Solan University. Where did you find glass ceilings then? What's your, been your work history? So you were at the... <coughs> well, I worked in Bozash, huh. right? Now, when that project succeeded mm. beyond anybody's expectations, they could not believe it, that that project actually made a success. Then they took me out of Bozash and brought me in the center. Then gave me fairly senior positions. What do you mean in the centre? From Wozash is the college at Wozash, which is 
20 miles away from here. You know, you go to Berzeldon, you drive up Berzeldon, and that's where Wozash Maritime College was. That's where I started my career. The Century Solent University in town, New Road. Now, they needed somebody to do big projects in Southampton. You know, the extension of the Southampton, the first phase of the Southampton. You know, the Southampton College was only small. Next to it was the, <coughs> you know, that there was another college, but it was not Southampton. It was a city college or something like that. It belonged to them. You mean Solon? Solon University was mm -hmm. first. And then there was another college next to it. And then there was the fire station, uh, you know, the, not the fire station, yeah, the fire station. Was it fire? No, 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 ambulance. Nursing home and ambulance. So they wanted somebody to do costing and finances for the Solent University to expand, take over that building and extend the university. So I worked on that project. We bought, 20, you know, 25 million pounds and did that project. So we extended the university up to there. <coughs> and obviously they then made into that other school. Now it is, I think, I think now it is a school for nursing or something. But then it was technology. Then the second project they wanted me to do was from there to t buy the nursing, uh, the ambulance, you know, where they, or the, uh, you know, where it was the um, clinic, you know, where people came and everything. So we bought all that. And you know, that whole building that is born to the corner. Now I left university. I did the costing for that project, but I did not execute that. The reason was, at that time, the problem was, you know, my, my husband had some problems and everything. So I had to sort of take early retirement to help him out financially. <coughs> so I started my own business. What was your own business? Same accountancy, doing accountancy and all those things and projects and things like So Solent used to actually recruit me as a consultant to do projects for them. So I did a lot of projects for them after leaving the university as well. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, you know, life in Southampton, when you got married, when you had your children. Life in Southampton, you know, like we started the Vedic Society, the Hindu Vedic Society, the temple. When was this? 1971 when we came. Now, my father, uh, Mr. Bhalla, Mataji Vishisht, and Kaliaji, these were the four pioneers of the Southampton Vedic Society, the society we have now in Redcliffe Road. Now, we wanted, the, my dad and Bhallaji applied for the grant. The council gave, uh, gave us a promise of 86,000 pounds grant, but that I said you had to collect 10,000 pounds to supplement that, to get into, in order to get access to that grant. So I remember my father, Bhallaji, all these five, five pioneers of this Hindu temple. Actually, they used to do prayers in uh, Clow Valley Road, you know, next to the fire station. They used to go to that hall. The, the council gave them that hall free at two o'clock. So they used to go and do prayers there. And they used to tell everybody to come. My father had a little suitcase in which he had the, you know, she was showing photos of two or three gods. And then he used to have, and he used to carry that in his car and everything and take it there, set it all up and get people to come over and take some fruit for prasad and things like that <coughs> and started collecting money. And I remember my brother Yashvir, who was a doctor, in, uh, was he qualified and qualified and came and started practicing in Southampton because it was the family home. Going to London and um, asking for money from people whom we had known in, 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 in and he, they had shops in South, in, in, in South Hall. So we used to go and borrow money, uh, buy money from them for donations for the temple. <coughs> and I still remember I had a, a tally register. That was my job. So every time we got any money from the temple, from anybody, <coughs> anybody gave us any money, I used to tally that and keep a cumulative total. 
every time we could put the money and the cumulative total. And I still remember that evening when dad came from the uh, prayers and he said, Kavita, this is how much money we have got. God knows what, I don't remember the figure. But I put the figure in that cumulative total and it just went 10,018 pence. 10,018 pence, one eight. Can you believe that? <clears throat> and I said, Papa, we've done it, we've done it, 10,000 pounds. We've got 18 pence more today. And then we gave that, those paperwork and money in the bank and everything, got a bank statement and everything. And we got the grant from the government and then we laid the foundation stone for this temple in 1980. Why was it so important to create the temple? Because it is, you know, like it's a, it's a place where community comes and gets together. You know, when people are living in their own homes, it does not make a community. People feel lonely. When they come from one place to another, they have nowhere to go. People's houses they don't know, the roads they do not know. But by making one place like a community place where they went and sat in, at Sunday in, at 2 o'clock, everybody knew that Sunday 2 o'clock we all could get there, meet each other, talk to each other and do some prayers. And it killed, you know, like a church. People go to church. Why? For that congregation, for to have that congregation. For no, and that was the reason for them to be together, to have that, you know, attachment. You know that, cons <coughs> you know, in congregation when people sit together, talk together, they, it feel makes them feel homely. Mm -hmm. That was the only reason. And this temple has served, you know, has opened up the the whole. You know, now everybody comes to the temple. You know, you, me, anybody, people have, you know, when we started, there were only five families. Right? Now, I used to do exhibitions when I was at the university. I used to actually do exhibitions at schools on Hinduism. I used to actually, I have still got the posters. I still can find the poster in my dining room, I think I have. I made this huge big, a, a, you know, posters of a, a, a eight, big posters. And then I had a slide projector. And I had <coughs> actually a CD, you know, the tape, the round tape that we had the before the, all that. I had that. So recorded, got different people to say things about Hinduism. Not me saying things about Hinduism, but people who are learned. And, and much more aware of all the shrines, all the this type and the other. They talked about Hinduism. And used to go and do exhibitions in schools. Every school would invite me. I had a whole calendar full. And Chris used to come and set up all the exhibition. He would come and set up the exhibition. Who is Chris? My husband, Christian. Christian. He would come and set up the exhibition for me. He would do the exhibition, then he would help wind up or put up everything together and bring that. And I did that for God knows how. And then every Diwali, people used to book, schools used to book me for Diwali. So I used to go and do Diwali. I used to pretend Diwali programs on air, um, uh, you know, early mornings, a uh, talk, you know, talk. I used to go there and present talks about Hinduism. Not Hinduism, but my personal experiences. <coughs> these things that you were doing in the school and the talks that you were doing this was to this wasn't talking to people that knew about Hinduism this wasn't talking no it was talking to people who did not know anything about us as a community us as people us what we believed in how we lived so this was to tell them and then they started coming to the school uh, to the temple 
Then they started coming and visiting the temple to see what these shrines, what the shrines were. What did we do? Why did we light a candle in front of the God? What was the reason for it? Why did we light candles in, in our house at Diwali? Because it's called Deepavali. What does Deepavali mean? Deepavali means a row of lights. Deepavali actually words is a row of lights. One single light is not enough. But when you pick a, make a row of lights, it gives enough light for you to do something. So that's on Deepavali, when we don't put one light, we put a row of lights. It is, we, we want to tell, we welcome people to our homes. We want to get away from darkness into light, from ignorance into knowledge. Our religion says to us, you know, you know, we are a community of the whole world. We say Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, Sarve Santu Niramaya, Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu. What does it mean? <coughs> Be peace with everybody. Be peace everywhere on this earth, on the planets, everywhere. We do not want, you know, we, we, we used to do a prayer. My father used to do a prayer back home in Kenya, in Nairobi. And it said, Hey, Nath Sab Sukhi Ho. God, please help that everybody is happy in this world. Nath Sab Sukhi, they're peaceful. Koi na ho dukhari. There should be nobody unhappy in this world. Dukhiya na koi ho ve. There should be no unhappy soul in this universe. Shrishti me prandhari. Ke anybody who's a living being, please God, Give them happiness, satisfaction and happy in life, that they lead a happy life. That was our prayer. Now that prayer was not for me, it was pray for everybody in the whole universe. His idea of life was not me. He would say, it's not me, it's us, all of us. You know, in the temple, he used to be called dad. He used to be called, you know, big, you know, like father, fatherly figure. Mm -hmm. He used to be a fatherly figure. And funny enough, he did everything, but he died of a cardiac arrest. And he did not see this temple with his own eyes. But the day we actually, you know, took, you know, I'm sort of, we actually took the shrines from our old temple which the council had given us to put them from those, that temporary shrine to the temple, this temple which we built. And we actually had a procession in the whole town. People dressed up, singing, dancing, and there was not only Indians dancing, there was everybody dancing. There was everybody dancing. And we took that parade right across the city and then brought the thing back. <coughs> so what we, what we, we actually, that temple opened up the Indian, the Hinduism, the Hindu way of living. Our way of living is peace, unity. You know, like we are this in this cul-de-sac. We are a big family in this cul-de-sac. Believe it or not, if I'm not here, Natalie will come and say, Kavita, where the hell have you been? And I said, Natalie, I had gone. He said, I haven't seen your car for two days. You know, we have a, we have a ladies group. We come and have coffee with each other. <coughs> if I'm not around, they will come and take my bins out and put them outside. Very nice. Good neighbours. How have you been responsible personally for changing Southampton for the better? I don't think so. I am... Personally responsible. I think it's everybody that came together. I am nothing. I can do nothing. I'm absolutely one big zero. It's only when others join you. I could be as miserable in this house as I want to. I am happy because of all my friends around the core, mm. around me. 
they make me happy they make my life happy so they t- they have they deserve a bigger credit than i do similarly in this world southampton has changed a lot <coughs> we all have done our little bit everybody has done their little bit people who gave money have done their little bit people who you know have got together to do the make the temple had worked out everybody has contributed towards it so no one person can say oh, i did this there is nothing like an i it's we um so it's not only asians you know africans english every community has come and donated something to our temple everybody has come to that temple and they have been welcomed with open arms and you know this is these are small things and no one person can do it hmm. no one person can do it southampton has changed beyond recognition for example curries now we remember cooking food at home and making sure coming home taking our clothes off putting them in the cupboards closing all the doors and everything opening the doors of the kitchen <coughs> and then cooking so that when we wore the clothes again next day it would not smell of garlic ginger or anything and my son always remembers mom used to tell me of not to eat the food with her hands you know we have got the tendency we tend to eat our food with our hands you know because we've never been used to eating foods with forks and knives we have never used them even we had them in back home but we never we always eat with our hands so when we used to eat with the hands your hands would get garlic your hands would smell of turmeric your hands will get yellowy with gummy i would refuse my son to use a hand and i would say you know no use a spoon because you have to go to school tomorrow and you have to sit with people who are not used to turmeric and garlic and ginger and it will become uncomfortable for them you have got no right to make somebody else uncomfortable so you mend your habits interesting <coughs> you mend your habits change yourself don't expect others to change you others to change for you and now you know turmeric latte garlic curries food mela who is not there on the mela who is not dancing in the mela is there any color is there any creed no because when you think of not yourself but others it makes a lot of difference that's my philosophy or could mm. be wrong but that's what i believe in personally i think it's very wise <coughs> i d- before we wrap up i want to ask you about a member of your family who people in our interviews have talked about can you tell me a bit about your nephew and who that is he's my baby he got up he I was brought him up in my lap thank you god for taking him where you have taken him hey god give him sense give him wisdom always leave make sure he's on the ground and guide him in his path for the future that's all i have to say tell us who it is that's all my prayer for my little baby did you ever know he would become who he has become that is all due to that almighty god and his blessings mm-hmm. nothing to do with us nothing we only do our job but that is his blessings he bless he blessed him thank you god for blessing him that's all we say mm. always we say the same i think it's amazing that the one of our um interviewees was saying about having an indian origin prime minister and how just like how proud it's made people feel yeah we come from very humble backgrounds we are from a very humble family 
very humble backgrounds and we thank the Almighty for everything that He's given us, every single thing that has given us. Mm. No words to thank Him and no words to thank our parents who brought us in this world and gave us the values they did. I think we're done. Anything, just keep recording. How was it talking about your <coughs> life? How was that doing an oral history for you? What was that like? It was just like anything. It's something that we have gone through, that we have